everyone. Welcome to day three of my Dog Is My Home's co-sheltering conference 2023. My name is Christine Kim and I am the founder and a board member of My Dog Is My Home and I am your MC. Today I am joining you from the unceded ancestral lands of the Tongva peoples. In the spirit of making our meeting accessible for people with visual disabilities, I'm going to paint a brief visual picture for you all. I am an Asian American woman with dark hair. I'm wearing glasses and a salmon colored dress. Also, as a reminder, if you are in need of any tech assistance during your time with us and on Whova, please email support at whova.com. And again, that's support at whova.com. Yesterday was another packed day of learning and connection around the theme of accessibility and well being. We heard from a lot of heavy hitters, including Carrie Morrison from Heart Forward LA, on reimagining our mental health system as being truly community driven and person centered, allowing people with mental illness opportunities to pursue meaning, purpose, and hang on to their dreams which includes allowing them to hang on to their pets. Habin Gurma, human rights lawyer advancing disability justice and White House champion of change, demonstrating with excellence that people who are disabled are not inferior to non-disabled people, and that the potential of human ability is endless if we can all create the conditions for people to fully contribute, including making housing fully accessible for people their assistance animals of all shapes, sizes, and training, and their pets, and our storytellers with lived experience, Sandra and Marlene, who shared with us their pain, their vulnerability, and most importantly, their strength, resilience, love, and hope for the future. This is just to name a few of the amazing people who graced our virtual stage on day two. And from these amazing people, a wide breadth of information was covered and practiced in workshops, including understanding the components of requesting a reasonable accommodation, who can write an emotional support animal letter, and then actually practicing writing that letter. Building a One Health Clinic collaborative across multiple disciplines that can make up human and animal health care. Taking a deep dive on standards of animal care that enable better assessment of situations that can be perceived as cruelty or neglect, and thinking through the supports and collaborative partnerships that need to be in place in the event that a resident with an animal faces an emergency, like hospitalization or inpatient psychiatric care, which would separate them from their animal. If, <clears throat> if you didn't catch everything you wanted to catch yesterday, don't worry. The sessions were recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing in Whova about a month after the conference ends, which is today. The recordings will remain available for 60 days once they are posted. As I mentioned during our closing yesterday, I hope you all good, got a good night of rest because today is equally, if not more eventful than yesterday. Today's theme is economic justice. This day is dedicated to reimagining the structures that keep us individually and organizationally bound within a model of charity. While the two are often confused, justice is distinct from charity. To quote a definition given by the Center for Economic and Social Justice, charity offers expedience during times of hardship. Charity compels us to give to relieve the suffering of a person in need. True charity involves giving without any expectation of return but it is not a substitute for justice. And this is a challenging concept for nonprofits and the people who work within them and for governments as well. How can we push ourselves beyond charity and building systems of charity so people do not need it? Today, we have some very thought provoking people joining us to push us outside our normal operating boundaries to think bigger and to act bigger. Among them, FADA, an animal rights organization from Barcelona. They have been with us for the past two years of the conference, and they are joining us again for a special plenary on the important 
broad adoption of their homelessness program across Spain. Since day one of engaging with my dog is my home, they have insisted that they are not interested in co-sheltering in emergency shelters. They set their sights higher on co-housing in permanent supportive housing, and I respect them greatly for that. Congressman Jason Crow, <clears throat> representative of Colorado's sixth congressional district. Economic justice occurs on the macro, meso, and micro levels. And there is absolutely a place in which to talk about government investment in programs and in turn in people and their animals in a day dedicated to economic justice. And Vule, the unicorn behind nonprofitaf.com. If you are a nonprofit leader, either in health and human services or in animal welfare, and you are not already familiar with nonprofit AF and the good work and writing of Vule, I highly, highly recommend you start reading Vu's blog. He is funny, he is irreverent, and he tells it like it is. Nonprofits are amazing. The people who work in nonprofits are amazing. The missions we are working towards are amazing, but the nonprofit industry is also broken. Our goals should be to work ourselves out of a job and we cannot do that working within the systems that we currently have and perpetuate. And now that I've given a preview of what's to come today, and also spent some time defining what we often confuse with justice, which is charity, I'd like to invite Teal and Zunza to join me to help better define the actual topic at hand, which is economic justice. Teal and Zunza is a licensed master social worker and is currently the program director of the Economic Empowerment Program at the Urban Resource Institute in New York City, which serves homeless families, including survivors of domestic and intimate partner violence, and supports them in working towards and obtaining economic stability, safety, and security. For many years, she has been an economic justice advocate in New York City, and she is currently the co-chair of the New York City Domestic Violence and Economic Justice Task Force in New York City, along with participating in several other city and nationwide working groups that focus on advocacy around the issues of economic justice for survivors. She previously worked at the New York City Anti-Violence Project, where she worked specifically with LGBTQIA survivors. She has diligently worked to ensure that the domestic violence and economic justice movements are inclusive of all that experience harm, especially for the LGBTQIA community, which is often the most disproportionately impacted by oppression, poverty, and domestic violence. Specifically, Teal has a passion for working to create pathways for survivors to remedy coerced debt. Through her work at URI, she has collaborated with city and state lawmakers to pass several important bills, one of which includes the first legal definition of economic abuse in New York City. She is dedicated to removing the systemic barriers that stand in the way of many survivors obtaining economic stability. She is deeply committed to addressing the ways that survivors of domestic violence are economically impacted, in addition to the intersecting ways in which many experience oppression and creating meaningful change on these issues. Teal was recently named for her for the Her Justice System Changers Award. This award is given to partners that have worked to shift the power to our client to URI's clients at organizational, city, and state levels using their unique talent and resources. Her Justice honors these individuals and groups who play an integral role in helping the organizations to change the systems to work for clients rather than against them. As many of you might remember from all of the years of the conference, but also day one of the conference this year, Urban Resource Institute, Institute has been a wonderful thought partner to My Dog is My Home, and we uphold URI's People and Animals Living Safely program as a gold standard model for co-sheltering. URI's economic justice program is yet another example of how all these areas of oppression and justice intersect. Families experiencing homelessness and survivors seeking shelter and safety with their animals need economic justice too. 
So Teal, thank you for joining us and for helping ground our understanding of economic justice at the beginning of this day. We are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to some. I know we're on different uh, <laughs> timetables here, um, but thank you so much, Christine, for that kind um, introduction. So I am honored to be here to speak with you all today about in economic justice and the way that it intertwines within all of our work. So as Christine already mentioned, my name is Teal Inzunza. I am the program director of the Economic Empowerment Program at the Urban Resource Institute, or I will refer to it as URI. I'm also the co-chair of the New York City Domestic Violence and Economic Justice Task Force, and I am the proud co-author of a very groundbreaking economic justice report entitled Reinvesting in Economic Justice, Equity, and Solidarity for Survivors in New York City. And the link to that you can find, I believe, in the chat and also in your, um, your information for the conference. So many of you heard your CEO, Nathaniel Fields, um, who spoke on Tuesday about your eyes, People and Animals Living Safely program, or PALS, as we call it. I am also here as the mom of a beautiful two-year-old dog. I'm going to show you guys her picture. <laughs> she's here with me every day, um, who's named Cece, and she's really, you know, helped me through many hard times. Even though my team's focus is on economic justice, uh, we are a very pet-positive work environment, and we have uh, a pet wall hanging in our in our entrance, which is the first thing that folks see when they come into our space. So I'm here in solidarity and in, su in support of all the work you all are doing as well. So I am here today to share one of the core pillars of URI's work, which is economic justice. That is my area of work, it's my area of passion, and I'm really thrilled that your conference agenda includes this key issue because it is an issue that quite literally touches all of us. Um, but first, a little background about URI. Uh, we were founded in 1980 um, and are dedicated to transforming the lives of domestic violence survivors and homeless families. We deliver innovative programs and services as well as offer safe shelter for the clients that we serve. We also um, have innovative prevention and intervention programs as well as the economic empowerment program, which I lead. In addition to working with individuals and families, URI also works to drive a legislative and policy agenda that creates sustainable and systemic change by addressing entrenched social and economic issues. And this also includes the issues of economic justice and abuse. So many of us have been working in the domestic violence sector or field for many, many years. And yet the topic of economic abuse or even economic justice is hardly ever spoken about. And yet economic abuse is pervasive. So economic abuse is defined as when one person uses tactics of power and control to restrain or sabotage another person's ability to acquire, use, or maintain the economic resources in which they are entitled to. We know that 98% of domestic violence survivors have experienced some form of economic abuse, which can have a multitude of short-term and long-term effects. While we know that economic abuse occurs interpersonally, we also know that this is occurring within a greater societal context. Black and Latina women have been historically underpaid and experience some of the highest rates of poverty across the country. In addition, individuals that identify as LGBTQIA plus are 21% more likely to experience poverty than their cisgender heterosexual counterparts. The racist, misogynistic, homophobic, and transphobic systems that the United States was founded on has created systemic inequities that only further compound a survivor's experience of economic abuse. So given all of this, what do we do? Our answer to this question is to advocate for economic justice for survivors. So let's dive into what economic justice is, because this may be a new term for some of you. It may be a very familiar one um, to, to others. Um, and I appreciate Christine's definition at the beginning. Um, so there are clear, there are many definitions of what uh, economic justice is. 
I'm going to take a definition in particular uh, from a report that looks into the prolific employment discrimination that the trans and non-binary communities experience, which was done by an organization that I used to work with, the New York City Anti-Violence Project. And in their definition, they state that economic justice is the equitable access to resources, such as meaningful work, housing, education, that enables survivors to live the life they choose. I believe that a critical element of economic justice is what my colleagues at the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice refer to as economic agency. They define economic agency as the value that survivors should have meaningful access to economic resources and opportunities. Our task as providers is to, to support them in navigating and changing inequitable systems. I know that this type of systems change work should be very familiar to many of you at this conference because you all have been dedicated to supporting the necessary system changes needed to support folks in co-sheltering and co-housing um, with their pet, uh, which I know is no small task. So what are the important elements of economic justice? As you heard in, in the definition that I shared, there are a few specific areas uh, that we focus on in particular. The first are the economic impacts of abuse. Survivors are often restricted from working or accessing education, meaning that they miss out on valuable work or educational experience, which can result in low wages or, or no income. A survivor may, not, may also not have access to their own money, their mail, their bank account, Often identity theft or coerced debt is a tactic of abuse, which can result in high debt loads and damaged credit. Coerced debt is described as debt that an abusive person forces a survivor to take out in their own name, non-consensually. This often occurs through actual or perceived threats made by an abusive person towards the survivor, their children, their family, their pets, their friends, or others. There are currently only three states, which include Texas, California, and Maine, that have legal remedies for survivors to get released from coerced debt. And the impacts of not being able to do so can be really devastating to survivors. The second issue area is around housing, which I know you all know lots about. Uh, domestic violence is the leading cause of homelessness for many survivors. The result of economic abuse can also lead to a survivor's credit being very low, which makes their search for housing nearly impossible at times. In addition, the lack of affordable housing is a huge, huge issue in our city and across the country. The third issue area is around public benefits. Survivors are often restricted from accessing public benefits or other government resources that are impor important yet often difficult to obtain. There are many ways in which survivors often struggle with public benefits, and these can also be a tool used as a form of, of power and control within an abusive relationship. Another major element of economic justice is survivor-led and supported mutual aid and cooperative spaces. This is something that's often referred to as a solidarity economy which is a framework built upon the values of cooperation, social and racial justice, democracy, mutualism, and ecological sustainability. The need for a solidarity economy often arises from many communities experiencing exclusion from mainstream economic opportunities, employment sectors, financial institutions, um, and other economic resources, along with the criminalization of participation in survival and alternative economies. This occurs especially for survivors who are marginalized by race, immigration status, and or um, LGBTQIA plus identities. Solidarity economies are an example of what our world could look like if our systems were equitable and led by survivors. So, how do we do this work? It's not easy, um, but it is not uncommon for us as providers or, or as individuals who work with homeless folks and domestic violence survivors to be very uncomfortable with speaking about 
finances or economics. This is something I hear from advocates and case managers from across the country, so you're not alone. Uh, discussing this makes us confront our own anxieties and fears when it comes to money, and yet if we do not work with survivors on this aspect of their life, we are missing a huge portion of what they're experiencing and often what they're stressed about. I have often had clients say to me, if I didn't talk to you about this, I don't know who I would talk to. This shows me that when it comes to talking, when it comes to survivors' finances, survivors are additionally isolated. And that's not even to mention the additional shame that many people experience when talking about money. I would like to mention that what I'm referring to is not simply to provide survivors with which with what many refer to as financial literacy. That phrase is one that I steer clear of um, because it, it implies that our clients are financially illiterate. When in fact, many of the clients I have worked with who are the poorest are the most financially savvy people I have ever met. I have seen a single mother with three children stretch a dollar further than I could have even imagined. Our goal is to work with clients to explore their strategies for surviving financially, providing them with information that could be helpful, and supporting them with navigating complicated systems while simultaneously fighting to change those systems to make them better. Often, financial literacy looks at the person and sees the things, sees them or the things that they are doing financially as the problem. And we know from our work that people are not the problem. These flawed systems are. As you all know deeply, an essential tenet of, of trauma-informed care is about choice. Survivors have often experienced a lack of freedom and choice in their relationships. And a powerful way to empower survivors is to have them take the lead in deciding what direction their life goes. This is true for survivors and individuals who know that it is best for them to bring their pet into shelter with them. Our role as advocates is to create systems that provide opportunities for individuals to make the best choice for them, rather than engage in systems that mimic abusive relationships and behaviors. Our goal as a collaborative that worked on this report that I mentioned before in New York City is to address systems change by doing the following. Firstly, we want to advance equitable responses and resources for gender-based violence survivors. Secondly, we want to place survivor equity and solidarity at the center of our city and state economic development. Third, we want to dismantle deeply ingrained racist systems and practices in our institution and invest in new ideas. And lastly, we want to engage survivors in government policy and planning. This is no small task, as you can see, it's, it's, it's a large goal, um, but we are working diligently towards you know, these goals. In New York City, we have been working on city and state legislation, as you heard before, and this month we're thrilled to get the first legal definition of economic abuse in New York City's human rights law. We have also helped author state legislation that would make it possible for survivors to get released from coerced debt. If this passes, it would make us the fourth state in the United States to have coerced debt legislation. We're hoping that it passes. <laughs> Lastly, I think it's crucial for funders to invest in and fund projects that are looking to do this type of economic justice work and survivor-led cooperatives and solidarity economies. Economic justice is essential to all of our lives and is crucial in creating a more just and equitable world. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak with you today. It has been an honor to share and speak with you about this topic that I care very deeply about. And I hope this introduction to economic justice was useful. And I look forward to seeing the ways in which you know, our work intersects in the future. Um, if you'd like to read the report, as I mentioned, you can download it. Um, in the conference agenda link, it's free. Um, and Or you can visit URI's website at www.urinyc.org. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teal. This was so important, and I'm glad you joined us early to prepare us for the content of the day. Your message is really powerful, and I also think we will all be ever able to better absorb and participate in the conversations from you setting the stage for us. 
So thank you again for joining us.